happy pancake day. Excited to get home and get some pancakes going. Um, so today I wanted to cover how you can buy your first property. Uh, so I'm going to cover a little bit around mortgages, what's going on with the property market, ask you a few questions as well on prices. Um, if you're quick enough on Google, you can probably get the answer. If not, we'll get straight to it. So before going through, um, who is this random guy standing in front of you? Anyone heard of Facebook? Is this thing people used to use before TikTok? I'm not sure if you heard of it, but we've got a, a company that does estate agency and property. Uh, we're big on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. There's a podcast you can listen to as well uh, for property investing. Um, and we do also jump on TikTok as well. But I've been in property for 20 years, so I'm going to share some of my knowledge with you today. Um, so first question I've got for anyone that's feeling brave, what do you actually think the average house price is in the UK as it stands at the moment. Random stab in the dark from anyone. 350. 350? Yeah. Any ups or downs on 350 from anyone? What were you going to say? 700. 700. We would all be in trouble if it was as high as 700, but we are in Crowthorne after all, so it may be somewhere around there here. So average house price, there is no such thing as an average house price. There is no average house. But across the country, we're in the south of England where it potentially is a little bit higher. But across the country as it stands at the moment, this was from yesterday, it's just under 300,000. Now 295, we'll round it up to 295. Probably in Crowthorn may get you a two bedroom apartment, probably a one bed in Bucklers Park or somewhere like that, I would say. So although that's the average house price for the UK around here, it's a little bit different. You may need to go a little bit further um, out of the area if you did want to start buying a house for 300,000. And we'll see what prices do when everyone in the room is ready to start buying. Um, the next question I've got is what do you think the average house price was before COVID? So 2020, start of 2020. Any guesses whether it's higher or lower? Who's brave? What we got? 250, good shout. Anyone else? 250 is pretty much there or thereabouts. So well done to you for uh, jumping on that. So 19% increase that's happened since COVID. Um, what often happens in the media with uh, the property house prices and the industry is you kind of get one picture that gets painted. And when we had lockdown, everyone was expecting the market to kind of crumble. In fact, it just stopped. And then as soon as lockdown was opened and the housing minister reopened things, everything went a little bit crazy and the prices started to really rocket and rocket. Um, what we've seen over the last five months since the mini budget was that prices have now corrected, they come back down a little bit. So if you look across the last year, it's probably around plus 2%. But if you take it all the way back to um, January 2020, then average house prices were, when we look at that one, call it the best part of 50K difference um, and a 19% increase. So they are changing all the time. Um, and it does mean that as a first time buyer, it sometimes get a little bit more tricky as prices go up but hopefully everything becomes relative. So what is the average um, age for a first time buyer in the UK? What do you reckon the average age is? Who's feeling brave? Someone at the back shouted a number there? 25? Anyone up or down on 25? No, just a straight no, like that, fair enough. So the average um, age in the UK is actually 32.1. That point one is obviously important, but 32 years old is the average age for a first time buyer in the UK, which feels quite old, especially for you guys, I would have thought in terms of going from university to wanting to buy a property or going from college into wanting to buy a property. So it is quite hard. And the reason why I wanted to do this talk and why I want to love coming into schools and talking to people is there's a lot that you need to do in your early 20s to get you in a position to be able to do that, which we're going to cover on some of those points today. So not many people buy a property outright with cash. They use this, they use a mortgage. Anyone feeling confident enough to explain what a mortgage may be or explain exactly how that works? Not sure on mortgages. So a mortgage is a little bit like a loan. If you wanted to buy a new phone, let's say you wanted to spend a thousand pounds on a new phone, you might need to get a loan in order to do it off your parents, for example. They might loan you 800 pounds and you might put down 200 pounds to buy the thousand pound phone. 
It's very similar when it comes to buying a property. Not a lot of people buy cash, um, so you don't have to save the full £295,000 in order to buy a property, but you will need to be able to get your credit check done and be in a position where you can actually borrow the money. Borrowing a mortgage normally was, when I started in property, it was about 25 years that you would pay that back over that course of time. Now they're actually up to 40, and you can probably say the average is around 35 years at the average term of buying your house back effectively. So a mortgage is pretty much set up like this. I've used 35% as a deposit on this graphic because it's quite easy to represent. You probably find most first time buyers, it's about 15% that they would put down. So you would save for 35% of the deposit. So the iPhone equivalent being the 200 pounds. Let's call it 60 grand, something like that. And then the rest of it will be done from a mortgage from the bank or from a building society. Um, deposits, more and more these days, are coming from the bank of mum and dad rather than being saved. So you need to start tapping into them early. Make sure you're on that good behaviour to get that deposit off of them. That will definitely help you get on the ladder a little bit quicker. But it's split into two ways. Half of it is from the bank, and then, or in this case, 65% is from the bank, and 35% would come from your particular savings. What's really important is that the deposit size is something you think about as early as you possibly can, because it will take you quite a long time to save that deposit. Anyone got a rough idea on what they think the average deposit for a first time buyer would be in the UK? You were definitely gonna say something. Go on, what have you got? 50 grand, not a bad shout. Anyone over here? Advances, down, up. He's pretty much there, 61,000 pounds. Not a bad shout, to be fair, not a bad shout at all. Um, again, because we're in the south of England and Crowthorn is quite a lot of money, if you're gonna stay in Crowthorn or Wokenham, Bracknell Forest, in and around these areas, you may find that's gonna need to be a little bit more if you wanted a house, or it could be a little bit less and maybe get on the ladder by starting with a, a one bedroom flat or a two bedroom flat, something like that. But 61 grand, it's, it's quite a lot of money, right? It's, it's a lot of money to save. So there's a lot of work and a lot of extra hours to, to be done or tap into that bank of mum and dad. It's always a good one. They've got lots of equity in their house, most likely, because as we've seen, prices have gone up. So that's the deposit that you would need. And then the rest would be mortgage. So I don't know if anyone's got quick maths on it, but the difference between the average house price and the 61K, let's just call it somewhere around 200,000 pounds that you're gonna get from a mortgage. Um, and that's pretty much how you buy a property. So I just wanted to explain the rates, because to borrow a mortgage, you're gonna need to pay an interest rate. The interest rate typically is set by the Bank of England base rate, which is now at 4% as of last month. Um, but it's not always done on the 4%, but I'm not gonna get into the complex of that. At the moment, there are some that are a little bit lower. But if we were using the deposit and we were buying at 250,000 pounds, this is the difference that you would see for the same amount of money being borrowed, depending on what the rates are. If we went back to this time last year, you could get a rate of about 1%, whereas at the moment, the cheapest rate you can find is 395 that you would need a 40% deposit, but based on borrowing 250,000 pounds, it's 1,186 pounds a month that that's gonna cost you. So if you were to rent a property and you had your deposit and call it 300 grand roughly, that property you're gonna rent is about 1,400 pounds in rent as an average, but you could get a mortgage and you could live in that property and own it for just under 1,200. So, a lot of the market is dictated by what the rent is versus what the mortgage levels are. Um, at the moment, if you were to put down a smaller deposit, you would have to pay a higher interest rate, and then you'd be paying more around where the rent value is. But even with just a 5% deposit, if you could get on the ladder and buy a home rather than renting a home, you would still be paying a little bit less than what you would rent the same property for. And obviously it'd be your home. When you think about renting, it's someone else's mortgage you're paying off when you're thinking about getting a mortgage and getting on the ladder yourself, it's your property, it's your mortgage you're paying off. So there's a real benefit to being able to get on that ladder quicker and not spend too much money on rent. So one of the things I often say to uh, friends of mine or family, if they're looking to get on the ladder and they can avoid going and renting a property, stay at home a little bit longer and save some money, that's more often the best way to do it. So. Hopefully you've got a good place at home where you can stay a little bit longer and save up for some of that deposit 
and get yourself on the ladder. But that's the difference in the rates, interest rates. Any questions on that or is that, is that all right? Mortgage rates, it's a bit like the term that you get on a credit card or car finance or anything like that. Got some nods, so we're gonna go with a yes. This is one of the most important things and this is one of the key reasons why um, I kind of said to a few people I wanted to come in and talk to schools because what I often see with um, buyers that come to us that are looking to get on the property ladder, one of the first things, first things they need to do is speak to a mortgage advisor. Um, they've got a deposit saved, they're ready, they've got a good salary and they're ready to get on the ladder. And one of the key reasons why they don't buy a property or they're not able to buy a property is because the bank declines them on the mortgage. And more often than not, that's because their credit rating has been hindered often in their early 20s, where they've not really thought about that end goal of buying a property. And I wish I was told that early on. Um, and I wish a lot of family and friends had been told that early on. So I'm giving you that little bit of advice today. Just think about it when you start thinking about credit cards, store cards, car finance, stuff like that. If you miss those payments, it will hinder your credit score and it will stop you being able to get a mortgage. Some of the biggest credit checks that they do is when you come to get a mortgage, way more than anything else. You can get finance, you can get borrowing done in most places, but when it comes to a mortgage, they're really strict on what your credit rating looks like. Um, and it's not just a case of don't go and get any credit because as we look at um, things here, all of these different areas can give you credit, you just need to make sure you pay them. And actually you can't get a credit rating unless you do get some of these different loans and pay them off correctly. Because the mortgage company also wants to know that you're able to pay a loan off. So by doing nothing will mean you have no credit rating. By doing something and not paying it, you'll have a bad credit rating. But by getting something like um, a car finance or a small bank loan when you're able to, then you'll be in a position, as long as you pay that off, you show a mortgage company, you show a bank, you show a building society, that actually you're gonna be in a position where yes, we'd like to give you that money because you've got a good credit rating. Hopefully that makes sense, but it's just something that's really important. These are some of the things to think about. Gambling accounts, um, that's something which I've seen loads of people in their kind of early 20s, mid 20s have had multiple gambling accounts where they've taken up different accounts and um, they get kind of uh, opt-in deals and things like that. But the, the mortgage companies and the banks will look at that. If you've got multiple gambling accounts, they will score that down as a negative. Um, car finance, no problem at all. Car finance, just make sure it's paid, but it will have an impact on your mortgage. Say, for example, you've got 10,000 pounds worth of car finance. That 10,000 pounds, when you go to get a mortgage, will be taken off of your salary. So if you're earning 50 grand a year, they'll drop it down to 40 grand a year and then times that by four to give you your mortgage calculation. So all of these things, when you start making those decisions, can have a big impact on what happens with your property purchase when you're ready to do it. I've got no idea why that little flicky green thing just came in there, but it looked good. Um, renting versus buying. This is really important, I think, to just give people an idea of the difference being a renter or a buyer, because it is becoming a little bit more difficult, as we've seen with the money, to get onto the ladder. So the average rent around here is going to be about £1,500 a month, which is a lot of money. That will get you a three-bedroom property somewhere in Crowform, Bracknell, um, Wokenham. Small three-bedroom property as well at the moment. Um, if you rented from the age of 25 to 85, which some people do, they rent their whole life, then the cost of renting that property will be just over a million pounds that you would have spent in rent. One million and 80,000 pounds in rent. And at the end of that, you would kind of have no property to show, you just have lived in somewhere. It does give you the flexibility that you can obviously move and go wherever you want. So if you've got aspirations to go traveling or something like that, you can obviously jump around as much as you need to. Um, or if you were gonna get a job where maybe you would go abroad in different countries, then it does give you that flexibility. But it does mean you're not actually building something yourself or you're not building your own asset, as I like to call it. And you're gonna spend a million pounds in rent. So. There's a few faces that look shocked when I said that, but that's what effectively you would do if you stayed as a renter for the rest of your life. If you were buying, I put 30 just for ease of numbers as your first age to buy at, and 75, not because we're all gonna die at 75 if you buy a house compared to being a renter, but you're gonna have it paid off within 45 years because your mortgage will be cleared at that point. Using 45 years is the sort of term that I would expect it to be um, for the generations to come. 
So if you had a mortgage of £1,500 uh, a month over 45 years, you would have spent £810, but you'd have a house. So you'd have a house that you could live in for the rest of your life, and you'd have a house that was worth X amount of money that you could then pass down to your kids and your family as well. I would imagine if you'd done that level of mortgage payments, that house is going to be worth somewhere around a million pounds, probably a million and a half. But who knows what the market does um, in 45 years time. But that sounds hopefully a little bit better that you've got a million pound house that you live in for free for the rest of your life compared to spending a, a million pounds on rent that you wouldn't have anything at the end. Does that kind of make sense? Some nods, yeah, we'll take a nod. Um, so what's the difference? I just wanted to do a little bit of summary on some of the terminology for when people start to think about buying and what, what the difference is. Anyone uh, able to tell me the difference between freehold and leasehold? I know there's a little kind of clip art drawing on there, but any ideas? Someone's got it. Freehold, leasehold, any ideas? No? You've got the, you've got the deposit almost bang on though. So freehold, you've got a detached house there effectively. So a freehold property means you own everything. So you don't own the airspace, obviously no one does, but you do own the land that it sits on. So you own the building and you own the land, you own the freehold as it's called. This is really important for when you start looking at buying a property because the difference between leasehold and freehold does have a big impact on uh, how much it's gonna cost you monthly, also how much it's gonna grow in equity over a period of time as well. A leasehold, this is uh, a block of flats. So imagine a flat on the bottom, first floor, second floor, and then the penthouse at the top. Um, the leasehold, you can't own the land that it sits on because there's other people that are above you or below you. So in this case, the leasehold is the lease of the four sections of different flats. And that means that you effectively rent it for a long period of time. You never fully own the whole property and a lease ticks down every year. Um, the average lease is 125 years and they drop every year. So you're, you're buying a lease rather than buying a property, but you're buying the ability that you, you were able to live in that flat. So there's a big difference between the two. And with a leasehold, you also find that you've got a monthly service charge. So because everyone's sharing communal areas, they're sharing land, they're sharing parking, there'll also be another service charge to add on top of the mortgage. So if you can go freehold, go freehold. It's worth going three, five miles out of the, an expensive area to a cheaper area and go and freehold if you can rather than leasehold. Um, there's different types of properties. So uh, I just wanted to sort of cover those as well. This is a row of terraces. So terminology wise, this is just called terraced. Pretty simple. Any stabs on this? Two properties there? Someone's whispering it. Just say it. Just shout it out. What were you saying? Someone went semi-detached. I think someone said it, but didn't want to shout it out. Semi-detached, so you've got two properties, uh, one either side of each other, and that's what we call a semi-detached. And then the last one, if that's a semi, this one's a detached. We're saying it quietly, but I can hear you saying it. That is a detached home. So you own the whole property, you're not connected by any neighbors or anything like that. This was the average house price in the year 2000, in the millennium, um, 75,000 pounds. 22 years later, as we explained, 295 or 294, something, something. So there's a big change in house prices in 20 years. So if you waited 20 years um, to buy your first property, I don't know what the average house price is, but it, it's definitely not gonna be 295. It's gonna be something much, much higher. So you can make a lot of property and money as well. And I've just summarized that, the market is about to change quite drastically and there's a few things that will have a massive impact. AI is obviously a huge topic at the moment. Um, I'm sure people are trying to sort of use chat GTP for various things in homework and stuff like that. Sorry teachers, but I'm sure it's happening somewhere where well, it's gonna have an impact in the market as well. It's gonna have an impact in how people do research, how people source properties. And it's gonna be quite interesting to see how that happens on the property transaction. I put um, Bitcoin up there because people are now buying properties with digital currency. 
That is now a thing that's happening a lot in other countries and it's happening in central London a lot with um, people moving from outside of the UK inside of the UK, especially on higher level properties. And I put blockchain in there as well. I think blockchain will probably be the biggest impact to the property market that we will see. As soon as solicitors and the Law Society approve it, there is a very good chance that the way that communication happens between the property market is vastly increased and using blockchain and things like that will have a big impact. So when you buy your first property, I don't know what the process will be then. It could be very similar to now or it could look a hell of a lot different because I think we're just going to hit that curve where things will change drastically. So it's really worth just staying on top of how these things work. If you want to own a property one day, it's really important to just keep tabs on what's going on. You can follow any of the Avocado socials if you want to. And if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Can I ask a question? What's blockchain? So blockchain is, um, is kind of a digital communication. It's, it's massive at the moment, but blockchain is something where in the central figure, you could have a mortgage offer as an example. Well, without having to send that mortgage offer to various places, to solicitor, to bank, to buyer, to seller, to estate agent, Blockchain is accessible by everyone. So it's a digital communication channel. So I think that's probably where when the law society kick in and acknowledge it, there's an opportunity that things could just be put in a central place and just accessed from anywhere. It will also have, it's, it's the central finance element of things as well. I think uh, Russia just put a news article out that by the 1st of April, they are gonna be um, trialing central finance, which effectively means banks are no longer required because the finance is coming central and outside of the bank. So that could also have a big impact on the property market because it might be that crowdfunding purchases properties rather than banks and mortgages, things like that. So there's a lot of changes going on. Any other questions from anyone? Questions at the back, yeah. Yep. Yeah, if, if you were a first time buyer, you get the benefit of having um, a better tax rate than if you're a second time buyer or if you're a person buying a second property. So stamp duty, as long as you're kind of buying under 400K, shouldn't be too much of an issue. But once you start getting to 600, 625 upwards, there is a tax of course, that the government like to charge. It's done on a kind of algorithm calculator. So depending on what you buy, depends on what it looks like. But if you're buying at say 6, 625, 650, and you're a second time buyer, you might have to spend another 12, 13, 15,000 pounds in tax as well. Um, and then you obviously need to pay to buy a property. You need the mortgage, you need the fee, you need the survey, you need the solicitor costs and then sometimes removals and things like that as well. So it's not a cheap process. It is something that you kind of want to go all in and do as minimum amount of times as possible and not make a mistake on that property that you do buy. Yep. You can move, great question. Yes, you can move house if you haven't paid off the mortgage. There's a couple of different ways of doing it. Um, I mentioned about the term 45 years, 25 years. Um, the interest rate is normally set for something like two years and then you would redo the mortgage or three or four or five years and then you would redo the mortgage. If you wanted to move in your fixed term, you could do what's called a port and top up. So you could take the mortgage with you to the next house and then ask for a top up to get the additional finance. Or you could wait till the kind of term comes towards the end of the fixed and then you go on a flexible rate, which is normally a little bit higher. And then you're just free to go and engage with any different mortgage company that you wanted to. And at the moment, the, the trend is five year fixed deals are the cheapest. So that's unusual, but that's what it is at the moment is the five year money is the cheapest. So if you wanted to move in that five years time, you'd have to go one of those two ways or pay a penalty to break out of the mortgage term, which is normally two or 3% of the total loan. So it could be quite a few thousand pounds. But yeah, good question. Any other questions? No? Hopefully that helps, gives you an idea of how to get your first property. Absolutely, so thank you very much to Ian. Thank you.